Today, I wanted to tell you about another race on my world, an avian human cross species. I have a lot of ideas for different ethnic groups that could be within the species, combining different birds with different cultures and different biomes. But to start with, I'll tell you about the group I've spent the most time developing. This group lives on an open prairie, much like the American Western Plains. It is fairly dry with hot summers and cold winters. They are a nomadic people following regular migration routes in small familial groups, let's say between 25 and 50 people each. They hunt during the spring, summer, and fall, and spend the winter months in centralized towns and villages. For bird, I wanted something small and mostly brown, something ordinary looking. And this particular group is not meant to be super special or powerful or cool, just people living their lives on their own land. I was originally thinking sparrows or wrens, but a couple years ago I started raising Caternix quail, and I found that they are just amazingly beautiful little birds in very subtle ways. While brown is the most common color to find them in, there are countless variations. And the thing I find most striking about them is that they almost all have the same feather pattern, no matter what color they are. They have V-shaped ribbing with long white streaks. Even this bird of mine, which I originally thought to be plain white, does have the same pattern. It's just in the faintest possible creamy silver. So I thought it would be cool to make this race based off of Caternix, and use Caternix color variations to spice up the individuals. For now I'm calling this people Quillian, though I think that name is a bit on the nose and I'll probably change it once I think of something better. But let's talk biology and body type. The wings would be anchored to their shoulder blades, with the adjoining muscles, tendons, and skin extending to a point about at the waistline. A wingspan twice the length of their height would make for a good mid-sized set of wings, though this might vary between different ethnic groups, with wing size and shape reflecting their lifestyles and flying capabilities, whether they be fast flyers, have greater endurance, be strong and capable of carrying greater loads, or quick with optimized maneuverability. In order to support and operate these wings, the Quellian have very broad, muscular shoulders with great muscle mass centered at the shoulders, upper back, and chest. They would also have great core strength, and their thighs and legs would be powerful for sprinting and jumping, but not great at any kind of long distance. Overall, this will make for a fairly triangular body type. Wide shoulders, a narrow waist, tight glutes and thighs, but relatively thin arms and legs. Hair and eye color correspond to their wing coloration. Men typically wear their hair in a single tight braid down the back. Women twist their braid up into a bun, which could be done more elaborately for special occasions. I've always loved the description in Artemis Fowl of nut brown, although I don't know exactly what that means. I've always pictured it as a medium brown skin with yellow undertones rather than red or blue. I want to address clothing quickly, because I haven't fully fleshed out their clothing and that's not really what this video is about, but they need to wear something, gosh darn it. Avian people are one of my oldest fictional race fascinations, and I've swung many different directions over the years of what I think they should be like, and look like, and what they should wear, but for a while now I've been drawn to the idea of fitted leather leggings. This particular group, the Quillian, are an isolated people with little access to trade in materials other than what hunting provides. So for them, soft, flexible, fine, suede leather leggings would be perfect. A pair could be cut from two antelope hides and laced up the outside, allowing for better fit and greater flexibility. Underwear such as we wear would probably not be a thing, but with fitted pants like this you're going to want some kind of liner. So how about something roughly hourglass shaped with holes at each corner? The holes would line up with holes on the leggings, and liners could be tied in or switched out for cleaning however frequently you want. One more issue though is that leather is not breathable, and the prairie climate can be quite hot in the summer. However, the leather could be easily ventilated by perforating it, which is a common thing to see in leather and has been used historically. The perforation could be simple and functional, or it could be done by punching in elaborate patterns. One thing I really want to focus on is how much detail you can incorporate using the simplest possible tools and materials. Now for the tops, special consideration will need to be given to the closures, as the wings will make need for a unique system, but more on that later. The tops could be quite simple, sewn from leather. They could be laced up at the shoulders and connect in the back with a T-strap between the wings. For the women, a simple drawstring could add a bit of bust support. However, this is very plain and way more basic than I want. I've been thinking for a while about how they could create texture by taking leather cords and weaving or knotting them into a garment. Then I saw macrame, and it's just perfect. So, quailia tops are made by taking leftover bits of leather and cutting them into spirals, 
The spirals are then stretched out, forming long chords. The quillion have particular patterns they follow to knot the chords together, patterns that might vary by group or be passed down in families. Ivory beads and carved ivory medallions might be woven into the designs, and those beads could be colored using natural plant dyes. The shirts will typically feature a collar, often elaborate and beaded, to emphasize their flight strength and suitability as a hunting partner. Both men and women wear elaborate shoulder caps, heavily beaded and embellished. The designs would be most elaborate around the shoulders, and for women, the shirts would be woven a bit denser and tighter over the chest. They would often be edged with thick fringe and extra tassels to catch and dance in the wind as they fly. The shirts would close with ties at the back. Usually, women's shirts feature a slit in the back neck, and tie close there and underneath each wing. Men's shirts have a slit in the front neck, but also tie closed at the base of the wings. Men's shirts are usually looser fitting, while women's are a bit tighter with strategic cording for bust support. If the women had problems with the shirts gaping at the sides of their wings, the edges could be stabilized by weaving in a couple of bone strips, either made from wood, ivory, or bound bundles of their own quills. While this provides minimal support, I think that these women would tend to have smaller busts. Two reasons. One, the dense muscles in their chest would lend towards lower body fat, therefore a smaller bust. And the other reason is that I think their childbearing would be much more spaced out than humans. Eva mentioned in one of her world building videos, I can't remember which one, that historically hunter-gatherer women had much fewer children than say farmers would, typically only conceiving once every three to four years. I think it would work similarly here. And I think that because it takes several years for children to learn to fly, and even longer before their wings have grown enough for them to keep up on long migration routes. So the parents would need to carry them frequently. This means that two parents could not easily care for more than two small children at a time. So even having a child every three to four years would be a lot to manage. And while we're on this bunny trail, let's talk about wing development. Babies are born with wings, but the wings are proportionally tiny, cherubic even, with fluffy downy feathers, each wing about half the length of their body. At about age two, they begin to fledge, and the feathers don't finish growing in until age six. However, the wings are still not fully developed. So while a six-year-old might begin learning to fly, they will have lower endurance until their wingspan catches up to their height, which happens about age 12. At age 15, they are considered young adults, and at this point they often leave their parents' migration flock, joining another. They will spend the rest of their teenage years jumping between different flocks, and this stage will typically last until one of three things happens. Either they tire and miss their family, returning to their home flock, or they find a new flock make friends and settle, or they marry. This is good and encouraged. It helps the teenagers to learn who they are, independent of their immediate families, and how to take care of themselves, and how to make themselves valuable to a flock. They have the chance to explore other lands and territories, and most important, in a society of small family groups, it helps to keep the gene pool circulating. <laughs> All right, let's get back to clothes. You know, I was actually almost done. <laughs> this is a summer look. Bare feet would be helpful for gripping as you took off or landed, but in the winter, warmer clothes and shoes would be necessary. Perhaps fur-lined, or as someone on Instagram suggested, padded with down, but we'll get to that another time. They are not very fond of jewelry, however, earrings are significant. The only earrings they wear are the fangs of the Nash Diotso, which young Quellian earned through a hunt, establishing themselves as warriors. The earrings cannot be passed on, sold, or traded, and it is very taboo to wear the fangs of an animal you did not battle yourself. Therefore, it is mostly only men who wear earrings, and a woman who wore them would be considered fierce indeed. Now let's talk about wing coloration. I've made charts. I did my best to illustrate the patterning on Coturnic's wings with the long white streaks, the V-shaped ribbing. Also worth noting, one of the ways to tell male and female Coturnics apart is that females will often have patterned feathers across their chest. Males will have smooth colors, often white or cream. But that is consistent in other parts of the bird world. Males will be bright and showy, and females will be dull. This does have practical function. The females have better camouflage, allowing them to blend in and protect the nest, while the males will be flashy, allowing them to draw predators' attention away from the nest. It's a bit contrary to how humans think of male and female, but I like it. This will probably be more useful with other avian races, but for the quailian, I'll bring that smooth or patterned feathering to the undersides of their wings. The primary feathers will be lighter, as you'll be seeing their undersides, but the upper feathers give me some room to play. I think the females will have a stark, contrasting pattern, and the males will have smooth colors. Now for the color schemes of Coturnix, in life there are many, many, many variations, but I find it useful to limit myself. I have a brown based off of wild Coturnix, I have goldens based off of Italian Coturnix, 
These will probably be the most common colors, but there are also dark brown wings based off of Tibetan Caternix, and charcoals based off of Falb Fee Caternix, scarlets based off of Scarlet Caternix, and silvers based off of Snowy Caternix. These six variations make up the core of Qualian colorations. But wait, there's more. Avian races tend not to intermarry between each other, but within the Qualian flocks, wing coloration is no different than hair color, and intermarrying can produce all sorts of unique patterns, though solid colors are the dominant gene. For example, say you have a brown father and a golden mother. You will have a 30% chance of being a brown yourself, and a 30% chance of taking after your mother and being a golden. But you will have a potential for your parents' colors to mix either a 25% chance of a smooth blend between the colors, or a 15% chance of a speckled pattern incorporating both. Let's say you are a golden brown speckled male and you marry a scarlet. This is where things begin to get interesting. Your children will still have a 30% chance of taking after their mother and being solid scarlets. Because colors speckling and blending are a recessive trait, they will only have a 10% chance of inheriting your golden brown speckled pattern. But they will have a 10% chance of taking after your brown father, and a 10% chance of taking after your golden mother. They might be blended with a 9% chance of being a scarlet golden blend, and a 9% chance of being a scarlet brown blend. They will only have a 5% chance of being a smooth blend between your wife's scarlet colors and your speckled pattern. On the speckled spectrum, they have a 7% chance of showing a scarlet golden speckled pattern, and a 7% chance of showing a scarlet brown speckled pattern. They will only have a 3% chance of speckling your original pattern with scarlet. So in all, though you are mixed and show two color lines, your children will have a 50% chance of showing one solid color, be it scarlet, brown, or golden. Though you are speckled, they will only have a 26% chance of showing a speckled pattern. They will have a 16% chance of showing a smooth two-color blend, and they will only have an 8% chance of showing all three color lines from their heritage. The same rules would also apply if you were a golden brown blend and you married a silver. Your children would only be slightly more likely to show a blended coloring. But what if you were a child of two parents with multicolor patterning? You might take after one of your parents or have an interesting new mixture, but you would be just as likely to take after one of your solid grandparents. The more mixed the genes become, the weaker they are against a dominant solid color pattern. Having a child that shows a mixture of two colors would be fairly common, but the chances of showing a unique mixture of three or more colors would be rare. Obviously, genetics are way more complicated than that. If you count recessive traits within the solid individuals, and if you count the mild dominance of, say, brown over silver. However, the general trend would be for genes to revert back to solid whenever possible. So blended or speckled patterns, though beautiful and unique, would constantly be trying to eliminate themselves from the population, which would further incentivize young people to mix the gene pool when pairing off. They would be more likely to be attracted to partners with a color pattern differing from their own, hoping for a speckled baby or a rare color blend, which would be a significant beauty factor in such a culture. Okay, updates for this video. I didn't think there would be much since the original is less than a year old, but I've actually been writing a lot of avian stuff, and I'm like 50,000 words into writing a book that wasn't even on my docket. But I find that writing really helps expand the world building and hone down how it's used in a story, so there are a ton of avian details that I've fine-tuned since putting up this video. I've decided that I like the name Qualian, though I've changed the spelling to Q-Y. I've decided that I'm fine with it because they aren't based 100% on quail. Quail in real life can't really fly, like sort of, they just kind of fly up and then back down. So this race definitely has a mixture of bird qualities. So if all of my avian races turn out as sort of a mixture, then I like the idea of having the primary inspiration easily identifiable. The wingspan described in this video is realistically much too small, but there is a magical reason why they can still fly. And for now, that's all I'm going to say about that. Another update, to better keep track of the different abilities of my avian races, I've divided them into roughly three categories on a spectrum, hinging on flight capability. Gliders at the zero are not capable of sustained flight. They use their wings as aid in jumping, a lot like chickens, and gliding or even swimming, but they can't just up and fly off. At five are basic flyers, those who are capable of sustained flight, though they are limited by weight. They might not be able to fly for long, maybe minutes, maybe hours, and they're not strong enough to bear loads. And then on the far end of the scale, the tens, are the migrators. They are the strongest flyers with the longest stamina, capable of flying with extra weight. What classifies a migrator as a migrator is the ability to carry enough sustenance to move locations and actually live nomadically. In this video discussing Quellian, they are migrators, but they're probably on the low power end of the migrator scale, with not nearly as much weight capacity as the races mixed more with eagles, falcons, or albatrosses. Other factors will play into this chart, such as wingspan, whether a race has hair, 
hair or a feather cap, nails versus talons, overall limb proportions, human versus bird-like features, and other things. Okay, with the clothing, recall the part where I said that shirts tie clothes underneath the wings, and then the women's necklines tie at the back and the men's necklines tie at the front. I'm changing this because I thought of a way better idea. What if the center back panel that fits between the wings ties above and below the wings, making it removable? The benefit of this is that the panel might have a function, and different interchangeable panels might have different functions. Maybe one panel is for hunting, built with a quiver or other weapons holster attached. Maybe another panel is for travel, made with quills or other rods reinforcing it and keeping it straight for back support during long flights. Maybe another panel type is fixed with strapping, for harnessing loads to the flyer. Another thing I've changed is to remove the shoulder caps from children's clothing. If emphasizing the shoulders is considered an attractive thing by potential mates, it makes sense for teens to start wearing shoulder caps only once they come of age. I also think the shoulder caps would be an ideal canvas to decorate symbolically, with imagery to represent one's flock, or origin, or skills, or position, or anything else the individual foremost wants to proclaim about themselves. Now, about the 15-year-olds leaving their flocks and jumping to other flocks, I have a lot more ideas and a lot more to say about that, but I'm going to hold it for the video when we talk more about flocks and social structure. Oh, and I drew sort of talon toenails, but I forgot to mention anything about them. The idea is that quillian nails are a lot harder and stronger than human nails and will naturally taper if left to grow. But they aren't like actual bird talons, and they won't get to be like four inches long or anything crazy. Typically, the toenails will be allowed to grow out over the summer, growing up to two inches long, pointing and curving. When winter comes and shoes must be worn again, the toenails will be clipped short and level, and kept trim until spring returns. The fingernails are sometimes allowed to grow long, but rarely over an inch. This is mostly a personal choice, some individuals prefer their nails long, some short, and regionally some groups lean towards long or short. Okay, about the fang earrings? I'm not changing anything, I just want to explain it more. I had some people asking why the men wear earrings and the women don't. Sometimes with world building, something just feels right, even if you can't explain why it makes sense, and then sometimes you figure it out later. I was thinking a while back about birds, especially roosters and other male birds who strut around and show off their feathers to the females and then put on a courtship dance. I was blending that in my mind with some kind of spring festival with music and dances, and the avian men and women behaving a bit like male and female birds. And then I thought about their clothes. I'd originally thought maybe for festivals women wear the same type of woven shirt, but longer, with a lot more swinging fringe, sort of like a 20s flapper dress. And for the men, I didn't give an F. <laughs> I was like, eh, they can just wear their regular clothes. But when I superimposed these courting roosters over them, I realized that the exact opposite made sense. The men should go completely over the top. I'm talking mantles and headdresses made from fur and flowers and feathers and bones and whatever else they can find. Almost like a bunch of preppy teen girls at prom all locked into a silent but cutthroat competition to outshine each other. Except in this case, it would be all of the single men in competition with each other to be the most eye-catchingly ridiculous. So compared to them, the girls wearing knee-length fringed dresses is quite simplistic. In conclusion, it makes perfect sense for it to be much more common for men to wear earrings. If the earrings are won through a ritualistic solo hunt, made much more difficult than necessary purely for the sake of proving prowess and showing off, I can see the women just being like, no, this is stupid. I'm not doing that just for earrings. If there's a lion threatening our flock, let's just go out together and take care of it. You don't have to turn it into a big show and then punch a big old hole in your ear. But like I've said before, world building is all about generalizations, establishing the norm so that you can create interesting characters within that framework. If you have a culture where mostly only men go do this insane vanity hunt to get a pair of fangs, but then you see a particular woman wearing them, it instantly makes her interesting because you wonder why. What was her motivation to go on this hunt. Okay, the six main colorations. There are things I'm changing, but only minorly. I've been writing a ton of Quellian stuff, and actually using all of this in a story has helped me figure out a few things. For the names of the colorations, since that has been referred to often in the story, I changed charcoal to gray. It just flowed better. And I changed dark brown to black. They aren't actually black, but they are the darkest, and the way we describe things with colors often relies on contrast. But again, referring to a character as a black Quellian or a gray Quellian just flowed a lot smoother than calling them a dark brown or a charcoal. I considered conlanging the names of these colorations rather than just calling them the color, but there are only so many foreign vocab words you can expect an audience to keep track of, especially when a story and world are being introduced alongside an onslaught of named characters. I also changed it so that brown, golden, and black are the most common, gray and scarlet are a little less common, and the silver is the least common, though this varies regionally. 
I did consider changing the Scarlets a little. They are very mauve when in life animals that we call red are usually a reddish brown or a coppery orange. I tried a couple variations, but in the end I decided I liked them the way they are. It's world building, it doesn't have to be 100% realistic, and I just thought the mauve was pretty. With the color charts I made and the percentages, that was fun and useful as a potential model of how it might work, but when actually writing I haven't followed it at all. There are just some characters that I want to make blended or speckled as a marker that they're special. So I've ended up making the vast majority solid, a few blended, and only one or two speckled. So this would make it not terribly rare to have a blended child, but very uncommon to have a speckled child. And I think it would be incredibly rare for there to be a three-way color pattern and completely unheard of for there to be a four-way coloration. And this is a world-building versus storytelling conundrum. World-building purely for world-building, I love the idea of this flock of all of these subtly different blends, no two quite the same. But with storytelling, it's so much more useful to be able to identify significant characters easily if you make them noteworthy in some way. I've decided to mostly use the spelling avian to talk about any generic winged humanoid race and the spelling avian to talk about my specific winged races. I think my avians will have some sort of keelbone on their sternum, but I'll have to update my illustrations another time. Most of my avian races have a few extra bones in their spine, which is not enough to make their necks noticeably long, but they are noticeably more flexible, able to turn their heads 180 degrees. I intend for Qualian to be noticeably shorter than humans. Originally, I was thinking an average of two inches shorter, but I might bump that to three or four. I haven't quite decided yet. For contrast, Nauticans are on average two inches taller than humans, and Ocean Nauticans are even taller than that. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop for now. With my original videos versus the re-uploads, I have one more shorter avian video that I made when the original avian video went viral. That video is recent and there isn't much to update, so I'll probably just put it up as a straight re-upload next week and then it's on to new content. There's so much to talk about. I don't even know where I'm gonna start. That's not true. It's gonna be avians. See ya.